of the beautiful new best-selling book, Becoming, available now. Um, now, when you were um, a, a young lawyer in mm -hmm. Chicago, yes. you mentored uh, just a, 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 a little upstart, this little. guy just out of Harvard who He's was a hot, hot shot. shot. And he uh, was named Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the guy. That's the guy. Mm -hmm. And you guys started. You guys, uh, you mentored him, and you guys started dating that summer that you were mentoring yes. him. Yes. Do you recommend workplace romances, just in case? <laughs> yeah. Anyone from HR is watching. They, they worked out fine for me. So. All right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> you, he wasn't hot on the idea of marriage. You know, he. He was more hot on it. He was just being himself. He, he made an argument out of it, right? He made an argument that marriage was not necessary. Exactly. Is that not the sort of thing you want to hear, though, if you're... It, well, exactly. That would spark an argument, which he liked to do. So we would have these deep discussions about whether marriage was really necessary if two people really loved each other, and he would make his lawyerly arguments, and I would be irritated. And that's how he decided to propose to me, by starting that argument at dinner. <laughs> on, he, on the he night raised he was the idea. He was like, you know, let's talk about this marriage thing and how, you know, I'm not sure that it's really that. And then he got me revved up. And, and you I, guys are out at dinner. You're like we're in at, public at a, space. a dinner supposedly celebrating the fact that he had finished the bar exam. So this was a, a celebratory dinner. And so and he, he just brings up it out of picks, nowhere. He picks a fight. And so I deliver because I too am a lawyer and I have my points to be made. So I was in full making my point and I was like in three and A and if you think and da 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 da. <laughs> and by then dessert was coming out and the waiter put a platter on in front of me with a little box with a ring on it. And in the middle in the middle of the argument, I was like, what? <laughs> and I opened it up. It, he opened up the box and he said. Now that ought to shut you up. <laughs> did it? Did it? It did. That's nice. It did. That's nice. <laughs> now, um, yeah, you uh, you were um, a, a partner. You know, you had a, you had a, a very much of a partnership marriage, and you were a sounding board mm -hmm. for uh, your husband when he became president of the United States. Um, was the sound the board of you made always a happy sound? <laughs> or did he sometimes bounce ideas off of you of president and you'd go like, mm, I don't like that? You know, I tried to make home a, a safe place uh, f from the policy talk. Uh, I, I didn't want to be yet another person in his ear saying, you should do this and you should do that. I mean, everyone in the world thinks that they can coach the president of the United States. It's, mm -hmm. it's always amazing to me. It's like people won't tell their dentist what to do, but they feel like they can, you know, they know more than the commander in chief when it comes to a lot of issues. So he, mm -hmm. he would get a lot of that. CEOs and hotshot folks and everybody's coming by telling him, you should do this better and you should do this differently. And I felt like when he came up that elevator and came home for dinner, that we wouldn't do that. At, at our dinner table. So, so you would never say when he came in, it's like, I know what you did at work today. No, uh, if, if, I wanted to, if I wanted to deliver a real message, I did it through staffs. So I had my chief of staff talk to his chief of staff, which was the <laughs> same thing, essentially, but it avoided us having discussions about stuff at home. Well, that's nice. uh, so we, we had we we had uh, intermediaries when it came to business. It's like, go tell them. Would you like like what 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 sort of things would you have your your staff tell his staff? Like, give me an example about uh, anything. I can't think of anything off of hand. We mm -hmm. don't have time. Do we have time? We don't. I've been told we have plenty of time. <laughs> no, no disagreements. No disagreements. That's like we have time. We have plenty of time. No. <laughs> That, that's pillow talk. I, okay. I, I okay. Okay. Yeah. That, All well, right. That's office pillow talk that I, I won't share. It's not in the book, but I tended to try to stay away from telling my husband what to do from we a policy perspective. And here's the thing. I usually agreed with him on everything he did. I, I, I thought that his positions mm -hmm. uh, generally aligned with yeah. what I believed. And the times you didn't agree would be... It would be on small things. It would be on things like, you know, um, you know, 
how you reach out to the public, you know, how much formal stuff you needed to do, how many times you needed to do something in the Rose Garden versus being out with people, you know. Uh, there was always sort of an optics sense on the West Wing side. And I tell the story about optics. It's like even when we wanted to do the first Halloween party, you'd have people on the West Wing who would say, should we really be celebrating Halloween when there's an economic crisis? And it was like, it's Halloween, dudes, come on, you know? <laughs> Kids still need to trick or treat. So there, there's a, you know, a lot of times I would encourage, I would have to encourage them to lighten up a bit because the, the country needs seriousness, but they need joy at the same time. Well, the country Even also when... needs, I completely agree, mm -hmm. the, when people look to the first family, People, FDR said the presidency was essentially a moral position. Mm -hmm. And people looked to the president for, for a moral center for the country and to look for the first family to set that example. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like? How did your own family's uh, morality and the morality you were raised with here, how did that inform that sort of public morality that is part of being the example family for America? Did you guys ever talk about that, the pressure of that? Well, at, being the first of any, you know, when you're the first of anything, the bar feels higher. You feel like you have, uh, you don't have room to make mistakes. Um, one of the things I don't talk about in the book, but I talk about on the road, is that I do remember that at the end, uh, that that last flight that we took out when I was leaving from the Capitol, and we waved, we got on Air Force One the last time. I forgot about this because I didn't put it in the book, but a friend of mine reminded me that I cried for about 30 minutes, and it was just the release of eight years of feeling like we had to do everything perfectly, that there wasn't a margin of error, that we couldn't make mistakes, that we couldn't, that we couldn't slip, that our tone had to be perfect. Um, because I, that, was, that was the bar that was set for us, but it was also the bar that we always set for ourselves, thinking that a, as the first, people will measure everyone of our race, of our gender, by what we do. Um, and there is pressure that comes with that. So that's how we carried ourselves. And that had to trickle down to all of our staff. So the pressure was on everyone. We couldn't afford to make a mistake. We couldn't afford to look cavalier. We had to watch our language. And we also knew that everything we said, we, we thought about how it would be viewed by children, not just our children, but all of our children. We, we knew that we, we were the moral compass, so what? we had to uh, speak carefully and clearly and intelligently, uh, and we couldn't just say things off the cuff. Now, now hold on. You, uh, you, <laughs> you know so, my next question. So, you know my next question. May I ask yeah. it? May, may you I, can ask uh, it. Uh, the question is, is that as people took people who took that moral position seriously, and it is a serious position, how does it feel to see the next occupant, at least of the Oval Office, I can't speak for anyone else's family, who seems indifferent to that responsibility? Well, I have been very clear about how I felt about that. I, I gave a speech about it at the, 20, at the 2016 convention. Um, the question that we have to ask ourselves is how does the country feel about it? Because I, I don't think it matters how I feel, feel about it. I felt, I, I felt torn about it from the day I watched it happen. Um, but now the country has to ask itself, what do we want? What is the bar that we're setting for ourselves? It doesn't matter what you or I think at this point. It's up to the voters now to figure out what, do we, what kind of moral leadership do we demand in the White House, regardless of party, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of where you are, what do we want our president to look like? How do we want them to act? And if we vote for one set of behavior, then that's obviously what we want until we vote differently. We'll be right back with more. Former First Lady Michelle Obama.